I'm not sure. There we are. All right. I told you I was technologically inept. Now you know for sure. So God is giving us a second chance. <clears throat> Almost a year ago. <laughs> what more can I say? <laughs> I want to go back and reclaim my past. <clears throat> Almost a year ago, we were preparing to go to Malawi to visit Joel and Rebecca and the kids. And while we were there, I had the opportunity of visiting several of the prisons. And you've heard of some of the conditions of what these prisons were like when we were there. But in one prison, which was called a work prison, uh, there was a gathering of men in a room which maybe would be roughly the size of the center of the sanctuary. And there, it was on a slope like this, and it was hard to see because there were not a lot of lights, and there was a door and the odd window. Uh, but there were about 250 men sitting inside uh, for a Bible study and to be trained. And some of them would speak English, but often a lot were more conversant in the language of their own native uh, tongue, which was Chichewa. And so the main translator was a man whose name was Henry. And Henry was very adept at translating English into Chichewa. In fact, I learned he became Joel's main translator while he was there. During my conversations with Henry, I discovered that he also was an inmate. And so, not being too shy, I asked Henry, so what are you in for? And he told me in a very uh, honest way, well, I went to a bar one night with a friend, and we got drinking a little more than we should have, and someone came in, and there was a disruption, and we took it outside, and I got two years for assault. I said, oh. He said, but I'm getting out in May. So that would be May that just passed, which is about six months ago. So I said to Henry, so Henry, what do you do? And he told me that he was an engineer working for a major firm, highly educated man, able to uh, do well in that country. So I said, are you going back to engineering? And he said, no. I am not going back to engineering. My goal is that I will go back and get some training and that I will come back to this prison as a chaplain. The place which was that of incarceration would now become his place of ministry. God was giving him a chance to reclaim his past. Now, all of us probably have situations in our past that we would love to reclaim. And there are various ways that people have tried to deal with it in reclaiming their past. And as we think of those things which are there, for some people, they are just filled with remorse. And as they think about the past, they ask this question, why in the world did I ever do this? Or sometimes we might say, why did I say those things that were so hurtful or caused me to regret ever doing it? I think young Mr. Bush, who was employed with a major network, made comments with Donald Trump, and he is wondering, why did I ever say those things at this time? And as we start to think about the remorse, often feelings of sadness and pain will come over us. For other people, it could be feelings of regret. If only I could do things differently, I would do it another way. And sometimes the regret is not as deep as remorse, but it brings about a great feeling of disturbance within ourself. And then for other people, there could be feelings of recrimination. We want to take punishment. Uh, if we have been hurt by others, we would like to be able to hurt them back. Or maybe I will refuse to forgive those who have wronged us. And for some, it could be simply renunciation that I make promises, that I will do things differently. I will never do it that way again. 
So we try to do these things to get on with life, but often we don't deal with the past. So I know for Henry, there was great feelings of remorse. There were feelings of regret, even self-recrimination, finding it hard to deal with that in himself, and making promises to never do it again. But for a lot of people, this just becomes very temporary. And suddenly they find themselves, or maybe very subtly they find themselves, engaged in activities that they had said would never happen again. So this morning I'm wondering if we can think about this. Is it actually possible that we can see our past, as painful as it might be, as a point of growth? That God can actually redeem our past no matter what we have done, what we have said, how we have acted. God can take our past and use it as a place of redemption and of growth. And if we believe that, then nothing in life is actually wasted, but it can be used by God to bring us closer to himself. So think about what is going on in your own life, and maybe at this moment there are thoughts coming back about your past, and you're thinking, God, I haven't thought about that for so long. But maybe God is wanting to say to you today, I want to take that part of your past and make it a place that can be healing and growth for you. As we read that story in the Old Testament this morning, that was something that Samuel did. He did it for the entire nation of Israel. He took a very bitter memory that had been lodged in their mind for over 20 years, and he replaced it with gratitude. So how did all that happen? So let's just go back and look at a little bit of background. Samuel gave leadership to the nation of Israel during a very turbulent period in their history. The history of Israel was one that they had a series of enemies that would surround them. And often these invading armies would be marauders that would come in and take everything that they had worked so hard for. And one of the enemies that the nations continually faced were the Philistines. Now we all know the, for, the story of the famous warrior of the Philistines, whose name was Goliath. So that's the nation that was constantly harassing the nation of Israel. And they happened to harass them long before David, the little shepherd boy, came along and took care of that giant, whose name was Goliath. They were living under the oppressive rule and regime of the Philistines. But when Samuel came on the scene, we note that he was really a gift from God to his mother, Hannah. Hannah had not been able to conceive, and she cried out to God that he would grant her a child. And when she conceived, she said, God, if you give me this child, I promise to give him back to you to serve you all the days of his life. And so when he was a young boy, she took him to the temple where he would be raised by Eli the priest, who also had children of his own. And Samuel would come to serve God for the rest of his life. But it was there in the early years of his life that the Lord began to speak to Samuel in a rather unique and powerful way. The story is one that is well known. Samuel's asleep one night, and he hears this voice, Samuel, Samuel. What he thinks is Eli, the old priest, calling him. And he runs to him and thinks he might need something. And he said, I heard you calling. What can I do for you? And he said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Now that happens a couple of times. And finally, the light goes on for Eli. And he thinks, this is probably the Lord speaking. And he says to Samuel, the next time you hear this voice, say these words, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And sure enough, it happens. And that's when God speaks to Samuel. And he tells Samuel that the nation of Israel has wandered far away from God. And even Eli the priest has wandered away from God. And his sons are an abomination unto God because of what they are doing. 
Now, that's quite a message for a little kid to have to deliver to this old man. But in the morning, Eli is curious, and he asks the question, and Samuel tells him the entire story. And God began to do something at that point in the history of Israel where he started to bring his judgment on these people because they had wandered away from God. And the judgment of God was going to begin with the house of Eli. Because Eli tolerated sin, not only in his family, not only in the priestly ministry, but he never said a word against it in the nation of Israel. And as Samuel began to grow, it is said that the entire nation recognized him as a prophet of God and that God was with him. But the nation of Israel this time had become apostate. They had turned away from God and they were worshipping the Baals and the Ashtoreths. And the nation of Israel was still surrounded by their enemies. And it's rather intriguing that the Israelites were considered still a threat by the Philistines. And the Philistines decided to go up and do battle against the Israelites. Now what the Israelites would do is that they would take this box with them into battle. Now this box was called the Ark of the Covenant. It's a box about four feet long, a couple of feet wide. It was inlaid with gold, and on the top of it was called the mercy seat. Inside it were the, the Ten Commandments of Moses, some manna that was left over, and the staff that Aaron would use as the priest of God. This box became a symbol of the presence of God amongst the people. And they take this box into battle because they want to be reminded that God is with us, but they're also bringing other gods, the Baals and the Ashtoreths. They have become syncretistic in their whole approach to worship. If one god is good, two is better, and three is even better than that. Or we're going to be just all-inclusive. It doesn't matter who you worship as long as you are sincere in your heart. You ever heard that today? And that was the statement of the nation of Israel. And they brought the Ark of the Covenant. And they assume that because of this, we are going to be okay. The tragedy is, the ark was captured. And it was taken by the Philistines. And the nation of Israel said these words, the glory of the Lord has departed. It has departed from Israel because the ark of God has been taken. The glory of the Lord has departed. God has left us, and the box was captured by the Philistines, and the nation of Israel was routed. It's interesting that the place of this defeat was called Ebenezer. That's where it actually took place. The place was called Ebenezer. Now, you need to remember that because it's going to come up again in a couple of minutes. Notice, in spite of this, God said, I'm still not going to give up on you folks. You are my people. And even though your commitment to me is vague, shallow, or even non-existent, I will still not give up on you. So the Philistines take this ark. And they think, now we have an extra God who is going to be on our side. But as they took the ark, they ran into serious trouble. They were plagued by tumors. Now, I'm not exactly sure what these tumors were, but probably very, sat, very uh, sore and painful boils that they had in their body. And if it was taken to one city, the people were infected with these tumors. So they decided, let's move this ark somewhere else. So they move it to another city. It happens again. They actually go to five different cities that the Philistines had. And every place the ark of the covenant went, the people were infected with tumors or painful boils. And they said, we've got to get rid of this. This is the judgment of God upon us for what we are doing. 
And what these people were learning is this. You can't trifle with God. Another way of saying it is, don't mess with me. Don't make assumptions about who I am and how you can respond to me. So they said, let's send it back. Now they sent it back and they said, well, we better send an offering to this God because he could be really upset. So what they did was they crafted out of gold five golden tumors and they put it on an ox cart. But they also crafted out of gold five images of rats. So probably not just tumors were affecting them, but they probably had disease infiltrating their cities because of the rat population. It's almost like the Black Plague. And these people were desperate to appease the god. And they said, now we're going to put it on an ox cart, and we're going to take two oxen who have never had calves, because if a mother, if a, what do they call a female cow? A heifer, thank you. If a heifer has a calf, the calf's going to follow along because they want a nurse. And the cow wants to get rid of the milk. So they said, we're going to take a cow who has never had a calf. We're going to put it on this, attach it to this ox cart. These cattle have never pulled a cart in their life. And they said, we're going to make a test. If it goes to the nation of Israel, this is a sign that it's the hand of God that has been against us. And if it just wanders around and comes back to us, we're just going to say, it's pure coincidence. So they hook up this cart put the Ark of the Covenant on it, put these five golden tumors, five golden rats, and they let the cart go. And lo and behold, it goes back to the nation of Israel. And they say to themselves, in essence, we have been messing with God, and we can't trifle with God, because this Ark, which is a symbol of God's presence, is going back to its rightful place. Sad thing is, it comes to a place and there is not a great deal of celebration and it stays in a family for 20 years. 20 more years is going to stay with a family. In fact, what they did was they consecrated one of their sons and for the next 20 years, his task was to protect the Ark of the Covenant as a sacred symbol. The nation of Israel is now weary they have still a heart that is far away from God. And as we pick up the story from the reading, you remember it said, in 20 years. So for 20 years, one entire generation, they have chosen to live like this. And now they are wanting to make some changes. Life is not good. They realize that God is far from them. And when God is far from us, life is not the way God intended it to be. And so what happens? They bring it back, and as they bring it back to the nation of Israel, there is a sound not of rejoicing, but of repentance. And this is the first thing that we need to realize. We need to go back one slide. We need to realize that the people were told if the first step in reclaiming our past is to return to the Lord. And so Samuel said to the people these words, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then rid yourself of all the foreign gods, and notice this, and commit yourself to the Lord and serve only Him. Very exclusive. Return to the Lord with all your heart and be committed to only serving the Lord. So the people come with Samuel. They offer a sacrifice to express their sorrow and their longing for God's presence in their life. And they were told, you can have God's blessing, but you must remove all of the false gods that you have been serving over these years. If we want a new beginning in our life, if we want a remake, a do-over, whatever you want to call it, the first step is this. I will return to God with all of my heart. 
Now the people start to rejoice and to celebrate as they are gathered together saying, we are going to serve the Lord with all of our heart. And as the people are gathered, the sound of their celebration rings across the land and the Philistines hear about it and they think, "Uh uh-oh, they're preparing to do battle. They misunderstood it all. They thought they were preparing for battle, getting themselves psyched up when in reality they were celebrating and worshiping the fact that their hearts were turned back to the Lord once more. So the Philistines decide, let's be proactive. And in their proactive approach, they said, we're going to attack instead of waiting to be attacked. And the Israelites hear about it and they think about it and they're terrified because they know the history. They have never won against the Philistines. The last time they tried to do this 20 years ago, It was a disaster. And they cried out to Samuel, Samuel, ask God to help us, to enable us. And this was the hour that God was preparing to reveal his power to that nation. You see, a whole generation had gone by, and not once had that entire generation ever witnessed the power and the intervention of Almighty God. As the armies gathered, a violent storm erupted, and the Philistines were thrown into confusion, and the Israelites drove them out of the land. And the people knew it wasn't by their might nor by their strength. It was by the power and intervention of God that all of this happened. And they won the battle. And Samuel said, let's build an altar. And what did they call this altar? It was the place of victory. And this place of victory is called Ebenezer. Remember where they lost? It was in the town of Ebenezer. So now they take this this place of victory and they put stones there as a marker to say, God is our healer. Because the word Ebenezer literally means... This far, the Lord has helped us. And every time they would see those stones, they would be reminded that this far, the Lord has helped us. You see, it was a place of gratitude. They could look to the past, but now they can start to look ahead. They were reclaiming the past with a whole new perspective as they move forward in the days that were ahead. See, when we have failures, and we all do, and I know my failures, they loom large, we all need to experience God's grace in so many different ways. That was true of the nation of Israel in this place called Ebenezer. They had been defeated, and now they were victorious. They now saw themselves as a people who were literally being blessed by God. So in our own life, the, de- the pain that we've experienced and the defeats of the past can be brought under the transforming power of the Spirit of God. And that's what we need to experience over and over again. We need to realize that the Lord is the healer of the past. So whatever your past entails, God says, I want to bring healing and restoration to your life. If you want to live in the present, and if you want to have hope for your tomorrows, you need to deal with your past. You can't just have remorse. You can't try to beat yourself up. You can't try to make all kinds of promises you're going to get better. You need to deal with it. And Samuel helped the nation of Israel to deal with their past. And that place became known as Ebenezer. So this morning we need to realize that the Lord has brought us this far. Where you are today is the result of God's hand upon your life. But there is more. There is more than just what we have today. The Lord continues to promise to be with us. You know, the Apostle Paul was an individual who was quite unique. He had an amazing past, highly educated, 
born into the right family, economic status, position, power, prestige, you name it, he had it all. Very religious man. He was zealous, he said, in persecuting the church because he didn't believe in this Jesus, the Messiah. And he even consented to people's death. And then he had that conversion experience on the Damascus Road. And he became the foremost spokesperson for, the, for Jesus. And as we look at the early church, he had all kinds of accolades that could be given to him. He was an apostle. He was an encourager of people. And as we look at his life, we think, he's kind of got it all. But what does he say? He said, you've got to look at each day, but you also got to look for tomorrow. And he said, forgetting those things that are in the past and reaching forward to those things that are ahead, I press on toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So he didn't let anything of his past debilitate him because he was reclaiming it by the power of God's Spirit. We are never finished. We are people whose confidence is in God alone who has brought us this far. Paul said, I forget the past. My failures as well as my success, I have one thing in life that I want. I want to follow Jesus. I want to win the prize of the upward call. That one day I stand before God and he says, well done. That's it. That's it. A lot of us know the famous hymn, Amazing Grace. I mean, it is sung over and over in a variety of situations. And you know the story of John Newton, who was a slave trader and later was converted. I often wondered about how he thought about his life. And then I read these words, which is on the gravestone of John Newton. Have you ever thought of what you want to have on your grave marker? This is what he has. John Newton, once an infidel, was by the mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had labored long to destroy. God reclaimed his past. The Lord's forgiveness of our past is our liberation for the future. This is what the prophet Jeremiah says. I will remember their sin no more. You know, we often say to people, you know, kind of forgive and forget. We ask people to forget, we're asking them to lose their mind. Mind's going fast enough. God is the only one who can forget. I will remember their sin no more. So when you have confessed your past to God, you don't need to keep bringing it up because God says, I don't know what you're talking about. I can't remember it. So the rest of Samuel's days were not easy. The people chose a king instead of following God. Israel lived through the bungling of Saul, the very first king. But Samuel knew this experience. The Lord has been our help. And throughout all of his days, Samuel would keep saying, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And that's what God wants for each one of us, that we will simply say, Lord, speak, because I am listening, and I want to follow you with my whole heart because you are the one who has reclaimed my past and you give to me every day a new beginning. Thanks be to God. Shall we pray?